Hello, I'm Rosemary Bailey and I'm a mathematician working in agricultural research. Now you might think that's a rather unusual job for a mathematician, but in fact I'm a statistician and my particular job is to help the biological scientists with the design and analysis of agricultural experiments. Now, agricultural experiments are carried out at very many sites within this country, at many sites across Europe, and in fact they're carried out worldwide. And as you can imagine, being on a worldwide basis, they're really very varied in nature. And the only thing that really they have in common is that they're all very costly. Let me give you some idea of the different sorts of things that we compare in these various agricultural experiments. Sometimes we're going to be interested in comparing different varieties. So that might be, say, different varieties of wheat in this country, or different varieties of rice in a tropical country. Another thing we might be comparing in a tropical country is different crop systems. For example, we might be comparing having a single crop, as in Europe, comparing that with having intercropping. Other times we might be interested in different quantities of something like fertilizer or some other chemical. Or perhaps not just quantities, we might be interested in different types of fungicide or pesticide or so on. For example, which is better? Should you put on the expensive fertilizer made by a very well-known chemical company or should you use the much cheaper one that somebody's been shipping over from the Netherlands recently? So we are comparing all kinds of different things in these worldwide agricultural experiments. Now, it's not just the comparisons, what are we measuring in these experiments? If you think about experiments in a rather naive way, you would be thinking that we would usually be measuring just the total yield of some sort of crop. But if you think about that for a bit, you realise that total yield isn't everything. Economic gain might be more important sometimes, because after all, there's no point in actually achieving the maximum yield if you have to pay so much for the fertiliser or whatever that you actually lose profit by going for the maximum. So, sometimes economic gain. But it's not always quantitative. Quality counts as well. And again, that's not entirely for selfless reasons. For example, when you're growing wheat, if your wheat comes to a certain quality, then you can be paid an extra premium because your wheat is of the right quality for making bread. Disease is also something to worry about, and so you might be in some experiments measuring amount of disease. A modern concern is the after effects of certain chemicals. For example, when nitrogen fertilizer has been used on fields for a long time, there's nowadays quite a worry that that nitrogen will leach out through the soil, into the rivers and into the water for drinking. Pests, of course, are always something to worry about, green fly and so on. And there are also good, beneficial wildlife that you would be interested in attracting, things like bees and ladybirds. So that's some background into what agricultural experiments are like. And now I'm going to play a sort of a game. I want for a minute you to imagine that you're the mathematician and I'm the scientist. So I'm going to be a typical scientist and not ever tell you quite the whole truth. And you have to imagine being the mathematician and trying to do the best you can with what's been told you so far. So let's imagine we are trying to set up some sort of experiment for four treatments of some kind. They might be varieties, they might be quantities, they're just four treatments. And I'm going to be at this stage sufficient of a mathematician that rather than call these treatments by their real names, I'll just call them A, B, C and D. So here's a rather naive first attempt at designing the experiment. I've divided the field into four equal parts and I'm going to put variety A, if they're varieties, on this strip there, treatment B on the second strip, and so on. Well, you've done that, you're a mathematician, you've created this simple design. What's the matter with that simple design? Well, what's the matter with it is that I've been a typical scientist, I haven't told you the whole truth. You show me this design and I show you some extra things. 
I show you, for example, that there's some woods along one side of the field. Now the crows are going to come out of the woods and they're going to eat things from the crop here. So treatment A might not come out of the experiment looking very good. That wouldn't be very fair. Something else I haven't shown you is here at the other end of the field, there's a motorway. Here's the heavy traffic coming past, lead com coming out in the exhaust fumes, and treatment D is going to be badly affected. So that rather naive design isn't good enough. Let me show you one that's rather better. Here's the field I showed you before with the woods at one end and the motorway at the other end. Here are the four strips and what I've done now is I've cut each strip up into four smaller parts and I'm going to call those smaller parts plots. Now I've put the treatments A, B, C and D onto those plots and you can see I've done it in such a way that each treatment is here in the row next to the woods each treatment is here next to the motorway. In fact, each treatment, A, B, C, D, comes once in each row. So this is a much better design, and the scientist you would think ought to be happy with this, because now it's quite fair. Nothing is being disadvantaged by being next to the wood. Nothing is disadvantaged by being next to the motorway. But then you come back to me, and I'm the scientist, and I say, no, 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 that still won't do because again I haven't told you the whole truth. This is what I haven't told you this time. There is a slope in the field from high at one end to low at the other end. So imagine it starts raining, it rains all over the field, the rain runs downhill and it's standing around in puddles at this end of the field. And the way I've arranged it, that standing water is going to affect treatment C rather badly. So once again the experiment isn't very fair. Well, we can do something better than that, and that's what I'll show you now. Here's my improved design. There's still the square field with the woods, the motorway, and the slope from left to right. I haven't had to cut anything up this time. I've still got the 16 plots. I've still managed to make sure that each of A, B, C, and D is once in each row, so it's completely fair with respect to the woods and the motorway. But this time I've made some alterations. I've made sure that each treatment, A, B, C, D, is once at the high end and once at the low end. So I've arranged that each treatment comes once in each row and once in each column. And this is a very special sort of design and it's called a Latin square. I think that one of the things that characterises mathematicians is they do like to be very precise in the terminology that they use. So every so often in a piece of mathematical work you'll find a big heading definition and then something which makes rather clear and precise the words they're using. And I just showed you something which I called a Latin square. So here I've used this red squiggly underlining to tell you that I'm going to carefully define what I mean by a Latin square. So a Latin square of size n, where n is some whole number, well it'll be a square n by n. In that square we'll have n letters and the letters are put in the square in such a way that each letter occurs once in each column and once in each row. Now, although I've talked about letters, in fact, I'm going to be fairly relaxed, fairly tolerant about what I allow to be a letter. For example, sometimes I'll put numbers in a Latin square, or I could put symbols or colours, anything so long as I have n different things. So, let's have a look at some examples of Latin squares. Here are two Latin squares of size 3. In each case, I've just started off with A, B, C in the top row. And you can see rather quickly that once I've done that, there's only two choices. Either that diagonal is all the same letter or that diagonal is all the same letter. So those are the two Latin squares of size 3. 
For a Latin square of size 4, I've already shown you one. We constructed it before. Now what about size 5? Here's a Latin square of size 5. And as I said, this time, rather than letters, I'm using numbers. 1, 2, 3, 4, 5. And I've done it in such a way that each number, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, comes once in each column and once in each row. Now there I numbered starting at 1 up to 5, but sometimes mathematicians are a bit perverse and they find it convenient to start their numbering at 0. So now if I jump to n equals 7, here is a Latin square of size 7, and the letters are the purple numbers, 0, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, and 6. And if you look along any row, you can see that each of those numbers comes just once. And if you look down any column, you can see that each of those numbers comes just once. So those are all examples of Latin squares. Now, when a mathematician has defined something, usually he or she will ask himself a question. I've defined something. Is it easy to find those things? So, I've said what a Latin square is. Is it easy to find one? And what you have to do is imagine a sort of game here. If you're the mathematician, a customer comes along and says, I've got a whole number, say 10, and you have to quickly be able to find a Latin square of that given size. And as you can see, I've put the answer down here, a fairly emphatic yes. It is indeed very easy to find a Latin square of any given size. And I'm going to show you how. I'll show you how on the particular number, 5, but I think you'll see as I go through it that the method that I give you is in fact quite general. Here's the method. It's called the cyclic method. And I start off by writing in the top row the numbers 0, 1, 2, up to 4. So that's because I've got five numbers. I stop at 4. Now to make the second row, I take the first row and I pull each number down one and forwards one place. And then to fill up that last hole, I take that zero and cycle it round the back to there. That makes the second row from the first row. To create the third row, I do the same sort of procedure again. I take the second row and pull it forwards like this. And to get to the end, I take this one on the front there, cycle it right round the back, and put it on the end. So I start off with an obvious row. I construct the next two rows in quite a simple fashion. And I think you can see how I'm going to finish the construction. I keep doing that. And here are the last two rows constructed by pulling things forward and then cycling them round the back. So that's the cyclic method of construction. There's another way in which we can look at this. Supposing we look at a row and start to go along it, as we go to the right, we seem to be adding 1. 1 plus 1 is 2, 2 plus 1 is 3, 3 plus 1 is 4. And then here we have something that looks a bit curious. It seems as if we ought to be able to say that 4 plus 1 is equal to 0. Well, you may not all be familiar with the idea of an arithmetic where I can say that 4 plus 1 is equal to 0. So I'm going to have to make a little diversion now to explain this rather strange sort of arithmetic. Well, normally we think of the numbers written out in a straight line. That's not what I'm going to do here. I've written the numbers around a circle like this, 0, 1, 2, 3, 4. And on this circle, addition is going to correspond to moving in a clockwise direction. So what do I mean by 4 plus 2? I mean start at 4 and move two steps clockwise. Start at 4, one step, two step, we get to 1. So I write 4 plus 2 is equal to 1. Now, I sometimes put this little 5 at the bottom of the plus sign to show you that this isn't ordinary arithmetic. 
that little five is the first number that's missing. As you go around this circle, we don't have a five after four. We go back to zero. So that's addition. It's moving clockwise around the circle. Well, of course, if that's addition, subtraction is going to be moving in the other direction. So what does two minus three mean? It means start at two and move backwards three steps. Start at two, go backwards, one step, two step, three steps, and we find that two minus three is equal to four in this rather strange arithmetic. And again, I put a minus with a little subscript, five. Now, in point of fact, that sort of arithmetic, even if it seems strange, is not really unfamiliar to anybody. Because in our daily life, we're dealing with that sort of arithmetic all the time. Just look at this picture here. It's the familiar clock divided up into the 12 hours. And here, 12 is what is sometimes going to be replaced by zero. You're all familiar with this problem. If you catch a train at half past 12, should you call it 12.30 or 0.30? Well, how does it work? Supposing it's 10 o'clock now and you and I agree to meet in five hours' time. Well, we both know that that means at 3 o'clock, 10 plus 5 is 3 in this system with the ordinary clock. And subtraction, of course, subtraction is moving in the other way. Here's an example where that might happen in real life. Supposing it's now 2 o'clock in the afternoon, and I say to myself, well, San Francisco, they are eight hours behind us. What time of day is it there? Could I telephone them? I have to say 2 minus 8. 2 minus 8. Go back eight steps. I find it's 6 o'clock in San Francisco. So this sort of thing we're all doing every day on an ordinary clock is what I'm now generalizing to. I've shown you a sort of clock with five numbers around it, but we can do that for any whole number, and that gives us a system of arithmetic which is called modular arithmetic. And this is how it works. If you take a number A and a number B, you simply add them together in the ordinary way, but then if you have something bigger than N, you divide by n and just write down the remainder. The way to write that in symbols is a plus b with a little n at the bottom of the plus sign. This is where n is the thing that should be at the top of the circle where we put the zero. And the way this is pronounced, that formula there, it's usually pronounced a plus b modulo n. Well, with that diversion on modular arithmetic behind us, we can come back to that Latin square that I constructed by the cyclic method and have another look at it. I'm going to put on it a border of numbers along the top and a border of numbers along the left-hand side. In each case, we've got 0, 1, 2, 3, and 4. Now, to find out what goes in any row and any column, for example, if we look in row 2, and column 1, we have 2 plus 1 is 3. Well, that's quite straightforward, but if we look at something, say, with row 4 and column 1, 4 plus 1 is 0, we're using this arithmetic modulo 5. So the way I could have constructed this square is just start off with a border on the left, a border at the top, and everywhere within the table, I take the row number, the column number, and add modulo 5. Well, that's another way of constructing that square. But if you look back to this square again, the scientist might not be very happy. You see the square has got all these diagonal stripes in it, and those might happen to correspond with patterns of fertility in the field. So let me show you a way in which we could destroy that rather patterned effect. Here I've got a pair of scissors, and I want you to imagine that I'm going to take these scissors and cut up these columns and rearrange them. 
So just look here, say, at the column that starts with a zero. That's got everything in natural order. And perhaps you should remember another one. Remember this column that starts with a three. Three, four, zero, one, two. So now I cut these columns up and rearrange them. And here is the square with the shuffled columns. There you see is the column starting with zero, with natural order. And here is the column I told you to remember, three, four, zero, one, two. That's followed by the square, the column, sorry, that started with a two. Then the column headed with a four. And finally, the column headed with a one. So I've taken the square we made by that rather simple cyclic method, shuffled the columns, and I've obtained a new square that looks much less patterned. Well, you might be able to guess what I can do for columns. I can do for rows. So I take the scissors again, and you have to imagine that I cut up into rows, and I shuffle the rows. So once again, remember some of these rows. Remember 0, 3, 2, 4, 1. Remember 3, 1, 0, 2, 4. I'm going to pull this row to the very top. And here's the result. The row 31024 has come to the top, above the row 03241. And this is the row that began with 1, the row that began with 4, the row that began with 2. Now, in all this cutting up and shuffling, I've carried the borders along with me. So before we did the shuffling, we had the property that you take the row number, you take the column number, and add them together. Well, that property is still there. So if I want to know what's in that little square, I take the row number 1, the column number 3, add them together, and of course, if necessary, you do the addition modulo 5, for example, 4 plus 4 is 8, which is 3 modulo 5. So rather than going to all the trouble of making a square, shuffling columns, shuffling rows, you can do the same thing in a more simple way by just shuffling the numbers along the top, shuffling the numbers down the side, and then doing addition within the square. Well, of course, that's something that we can write down in general. And I call this whole method the shuffled cyclic method. It's valid for any whole number n, and there are three steps. In the first step, you label the rows by the numbers from naught up to n minus 1, and you do that in any order that you like. In the second step, you label the columns, again by the numbers from naught up to n minus 1, in any order at all. And then, to find out what goes in the body of the square, you look at the little square in the row labelled A and the column labelled B, and what you write in there is A plus B modulo N. So you use modular arithmetic, and that gives you a general method of constructing a Latin square. Well, why does it work? I haven't got time to show you in detail, but I want to give you a flavour of why it works. We need to make sure that every letter comes once in each row and once in each column. Let's just consider how we can make sure that each letter comes once in each column. So think about the column which has letter B at the top and choose any letter, let's choose the letter C, we want to make sure that the letter C comes somewhere in that column. How do I do that? Well, I say, what row must it come in? And I'm going to choose the row which is labelled C minus B modulo N. Because the rule for what we put in there is I take this number, C minus B, add it to that number, C minus B plus B is C. 
So that's how we get the letter C in that column. And the same argument works for all letters in all columns, and the same argument works for rows as well. So that answers the question which I posed to you at first. Is it easy to find a Latin square of any given size? Yes, it is. Well, as I said, that would be the first question a mathematician would ask following a definition. Is it easy to find such things? We've answered that question. So we now go to the other extreme and ask a second question. Is it easy to find all such things? If you give me a whole number n, can I easily give you all Latin squares of that size? The answer this time is even more emphatically no. I want to demonstrate that by showing you a table of numbers of what's known about some rather small Latin squares. In this table here, on the left I've got numbers 1, 2, 3 and so on. That's going to be the number n, the size of the square. In the middle I've got how many Latin squares of that size you can make by the shuffled cyclic method. That's the method I've just told you about. And in the column on the right, I've put down how many Latin squares there are altogether of that size. So for n equals 1, there's not really very much to do. There's just one Latin square. Similarly, when n is 2, there is really no choice. When n is 3, I've shown you that there are two Latin squares and they are both shuffled cyclic. When n is 4, you can make 18 squares by the shuffled cyclic method. And as you can see here, there are also six other Latin squares that are made by a different method. When n is 5, it's 144, which you can make by the shuffle cyclic method, but over a thousand altogether. N is 6, over 7,000 by the shuffle cyclic method, over a million altogether. And as you go down these columns, you can see these numbers are rapidly getting very large. But there is a difference between the two columns. In this column, even though here I've put only approximately 3 times 10 to the 8th, that's really because I was getting lazy. I do actually know a formula that will enable me to calculate the numbers of shuffled cyclic squares of any size. But when it comes down to all Latin squares of a given size, although these numbers are known exactly, when we get down to n is 10 or n equals 11, as far as I know, still nobody has yet succeeded in counting all Latin squares of side 10, side 11, side 12, and so on. So there's a question that's quite interesting. You can explain it quite simply. But even for small numbers like 10 and 11, it hasn't yet been solved how many Latin squares there are of that size. Well, the title of this talk is something about design of experiments with allowance for interfering neighbours, and I've managed to get halfway through without yet saying a word about interfering neighbours. So let's try and come round to what they are. There's a great myth around that mathematicians are people who are actually no good at dealing with numbers and doing arithmetic. And in fact, that's not at all true. Most of us became mathematicians in the first place because of the fascination we had with numbers and their patterns. We are people who look at telephone numbers or car numbers and remember nice patterns in those numbers. Now there's a variant of that which you do as a statistician. You look at large data sheets, for example, like the one here, and you get to sniff over, as we call it, data sheets, and see something about the data. Now with a bit of practice we get very good at looking at such a data sheet and saying oh look that one must be wrong or that one must be miscopied. And I want to show you an example of something I found from looking over a data sheet like that. It's some data from some, an experiment some of my French colleagues did. It was an experiment on sunflowers. Of course, sunflowers are a, an important commercial crop in France where they have enough sun for them to grow well. And from the large data sheet, I noticed something rather suspicious, 
and I've just summarized the data here. Now, these are nine of the varieties. There were actually nine. You can see I've missed out variety two because I noticed that something rather odd was happening if variety two was grown on the south side of the other variety. In these columns, I've summarized the yields. The yields were in a unit called quintals per hectare, if you know what that is. And for example, with variety one, the average yield when variety two was on the south side was 13 quintals. If any of the other varieties was on the south side, we have 18, considerably more. With variety three, if variety two is on the south side, 19.4 quintals, otherwise 22.6. Once again, variety two has made less yield. And the same pattern is true as you go down the table. The yield when variety two is on the south side is always depressed compared to what happens otherwise. And that's an example of what I mean by interfering neighbors. So let me be a mathematician again and give you a precise definition of what I mean by interfering neighbors. Well, first of all, what do I mean by a neighbor? Now, I don't mean the person who lives in the house next door to you. I mean the adjacent plot. And an interfering neighbor is a sort of treatment. I shall say that a treatment interferes with its neighbors if it affects the performance of treatments on adjacent plots. And I make no judgment about whether that is a good thing or a bad thing. Sometimes interference can be good, sometimes it can be bad. Now let me just give you a few more examples to try and make clear exactly what I mean by interfering neighbors. This first one is the example I've just shown you. Tall varieties can shade their neighbors. Now in the case of the sunflower experiment, that was a bad thing because sunflowers need sun. But in some experiments in the tropics, shading can be a good thing because it means that the soil retains moisture. So that's a sort of interference that can be either good or bad. Now consider an experiment on different varieties where they don't all germinate at the same time. If you take a variety that germinates early, its roots will spread out into neighboring plots and will take the water, the fertilizer, other nutrients before the later germinating varieties have a chance to grab them. That's bad interference. Now imagine an experiment where you're trying to attract bees. If you've got some sort of treatment that is very successful, it will attract masses and masses of bees to that particular plot, and the bees aren't going to observe the plot boundaries. They will spread out to neighboring plots. So that's a sort of spreading of good interference. And finally, my last example of interference is of spreading but bad interference in fungicide experiments, where we have mildew. Mildew spores are windborne, and if you have a low dose of fungicide, or even a fungicide that isn't very effective, it will permit the mildew to develop, and it then is blown by the wind into the neighboring plots. And I want you to have that particular example of interference in your mind as I look back to one of the Latin squares that I showed you earlier four letters A, B, C and D, each coming once in each row and once in each column. And as you can see, I've carefully put the north arrow in the corner of the plan. In practical experiments, that's actually very important because the person who goes out into the field and actually does something to the crop needs to know which way up to read the plan so that he doesn't mix up, say, that corner with that corner. Now, I want you to imagine that we're using this particular Latin square for a fungicide experiment, and let's imagine that treatment A isn't very good, so I've colored treatment A in red, and here the fungus, the mildew, is going to appear. Well, then the wind will blow, and I've put 
red arrows on to indicate what will happen if we have a wind blowing from the south. The mildew spreads to a C, to a B, to a C, and that's what I've recorded here. On the north side of this bad treatment, we have C, B, and C. Well, now I'm going to do the same thing for the other three directions. What happens if the wind blows from a particular direction and the mildew spreads? If it spreads to the south, then it spreads to C, to B, and C again, as I've recorded there. If it spreads to the east, we get B, B, D. And finally, if it spreads to the west, D, B, B, like that. So if you look overall at this little table at the bottom, you can see that treatments B, C and D are not very evenly or fairly treated by their allocation with respect to this bad treatment A. For example, supposing we only have the mildew spreading to the north, then Treatment B will apparently be a bit worse than it should be because it's affected by the spores blowing. Treatment C will be quite a lot worse than it should be, whereas treatment D won't be affected at all. Now if we use this Latin square for an experiment and we didn't take account of this, we might come to the conclusion that treatment D was very good and treatment C was very bad. And that might simply be because D is never next to the bad treatment. So all that money we would have spent on the experiment to draw a false conclusion. So it's as well to be aware of things like this in advance. And in fact, if you look overall and imagine the spores spreading in every direction, you can see treatment B is going to be extremely disadvantaged and treatment D much less so. Let's compare that with another Latin square of the same size. Here's another Latin square of size 4, and this time, just to be different, I've used 0, 1, 2, and 3 instead of letters. And now I'm going to imagine that it's the treatment 2, which is the bad one, and so I've coloured it red. Now, if we have spreading towards the north, what do we affect? 1, 0, 3, as I've recorded there, 1, 0, and 3. So any spreading to the north affects treatments 1, 0, and 3 equally. Supposing we spread to the south, 3, 2, 1, sorry, 3, 0, 1, as I've written there. Again, each of the other three treatments is equally affected. There's no unfairness. East, 1, 0, 3, and west, 3, 0, 1. So this time with this particular square, if treatment 2 is the bad one, no matter which way the wind blows, there will be no unfairness in comparing the other three treatments. Well, I haven't got time to check it through completely, but in fact this particular property I've shown you here would be true no matter which one of these four treatments is the bad one. And that property is important enough that it's worth our giving it a proper, precise definition. So here's a definition of this important property that we've just seen. I'm going to say that a Latin square is complete if, no matter which treatment is the bad one, every other letter comes as a neighbour of that letter, once on the north side, once on the south, once on the east, and once on the west. Now, of course, I don't know in advance which treatment is going to be the bad one. If I knew a treatment was going to be bad, I probably wouldn't include it. And so my definition of complete has to be quite general and say every letter 
because every letter might be the bad one, every letter has every other letter as a neighbour once in each direction. So with that definition behind us, let's go back to the square that we were just looking at and see it a bit more clearly. I cheated a little when I told you about this square before. It wasn't really a square that came from just anywhere. It's a square that I made by the shuffled cyclic construction that I was showing you earlier. So here are the borders, 2, 3, 1, 0, 0, 3, 1, 2. There are four treatments, so the square is constructed by addition modulo 4. For example, that means that in row 2 and column 1, we take 2 plus 1, and that gives us 3. Or in row 3 and column 3, 3 plus 3 is 6, which is 2 modulo 4. Now, I didn't get this square simply by scrabbling around and looking for one. I deliberately used the shuffled cyclic construction, and I deliberately used these particular border sequences because I knew they would work. So let's concentrate on these two border sequences and look at them. That's 2, 3, 1, 0, and 0, 3, 1, 2. Here they are again, 0, 3, 1, 2, and 2, 3, 1, 0. Look at the top one first of all, and between each adjacent pair, I'm going to do subtraction. 3 minus 0, that's easy, that's 3. 1 minus 3, well you have to remember we're doing modular arithmetic, arithmetic modulo 4. So from 1, we have to go back 3 steps. One step back brings us to 0, which is the same as 4, then go back 2 more steps and we get 2. Finally, 2 minus 1, no problem, that's 1. So having done the subtractions, we get 3, 2, 1, all different. Now the same thing with the other border sequence. 3 minus 2 is 1. 1 minus 3 is 2, in just the same way that it is there. 0 minus 1, well modulo 4, that means go back 1 from 0. 0 is the same as 4. You go back 1, you get 3. So in each case, we've managed to get the numbers 1, 2 and 3. All different. Think a little about how these sequences are constructed. We can never get a zero by subtracting because zero would mean that two adjacent numbers are the same and we've taken them to be different. So we can't get zero, we can get one, two and three and we've managed to achieve that we get them all equally often. And again that property is something that I need to formalise with a formal definition. Here's the formal definition. If I take the numbers 0 up to n minus 1 and arrange them in some unusual order, calling the first number a1, the second a2, and so on up to a n, then I want to consider subtraction, as I was just showing you, between adjacent numbers a2 minus a1, a3 minus a2, up to a n minus a n minus 1 and I'll be doing this subtraction all modulo n. Now if when I've done that subtraction the numbers that I end up with are all different then I'll call this particular arrangement a directed terrace. So why are directed terraces useful? Well what I showed you happened for that Latin square of size 4 happens more generally in this result here which I will put down as a formal theorem. This phrase in the middle here, if and only if, it's a typical piece of mathematical shorthand. It means I can read this sentence in two directions, from there to there or from the bottom to the top. It says that if I make 
a shuffled cyclic Latin square. And if the order of the column labels is a directed terrace, and if the order of the row labels is also a directed terrace, then I can guarantee that the Latin square we make is complete. Conversely, reading in the other direction, if I have a shuffled cyclic Latin square and I know it's complete, then it must have been made by taking two directed terraces and putting them along the borders. So the problem of making complete Latin squares in some sense, I can reduce to the problem of looking for directed terraces. Well, is that any simplification? Yes, it is. Because if you are just making a complete Latin square of size n, you have n squared little squares in there, and you're trying to rearrange n squared things. That can be quite a lengthy search. On the other hand, for a directed terrace, you're only trying to rearrange n things. It's a much smaller search. And I'll tell you a true story connected with that. The person who first invented this idea was trying to construct all squares like this. He had a computer, obviously not as fast as today's computers, but not so bad. And his computer program gave up at n equals 6. After I had got this theorem and was able to cut down the search from, say, 36 things to 6 things, I was able to do as far as n equals 9 just with paper and pencil. And really, genuinely, just with backs of envelopes, small bits of paper and pencil. That's the sort of saving that a little bit of mathematics can bring to a problem like this. So that's if we are talking about searching for all complete Latin squares. Supposing we just want one complete Latin square. Well, now I have two different things to tell you, depending on whether we have an even number or an odd number. If n is even, then here is a way that you can easily make a directed terrace. Start at naught, miss one, put one, miss one, put two, and so on, hopping up alternate spaces, and then you come back filling in the gaps like that. This is what it looks like when n equals 8. To make things a little easier for you to follow the arithmetic, I've drawn the circle here to do arithmetic modulo 8. So we go 0, 1, 2, 3, and then come back in the spaces 4, 5, 6, 7. To check that we really have a directed terrace, we need to subtract 7 minus 0 is 7, 1 minus 7, well that's 1, go back 7 spaces, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, we get 2, 6 minus 1 is 5, and so on. So when you've done all those subtractions, the numbers you get are all different. So this really is a directed terrace for 8. So now with that information, afterwards you should be able to go and create a complete Latin square of side 8. That's even numbers. They're quite straightforward. With odd numbers, the news isn't quite so good. In fact, the news is as bad as it could possibly be. It's been shown that if n is an odd number, then no matter how big n is, there simply are no directed terraces at all for odd numbers n. So just what can we do if we have an odd number? Here I've collected some of the facts that are known. For 3, 5 and 7, those numbers are small enough that you can actually do enumeration and you can find that there simply is no complete Latin square at all. Even if we relax things and ask for a row complete Latin square, what do I mean by that? I mean a square where I want balance for neighbours east and west, 
but I'm not worried about north and south. Even relaxing to just row complete, we can't find any such square for 3, 5 and 7. However, something interesting starts to happen at 9. There is a row complete Latin square, but nobody knows whether there is a complete one. Of course, by what I've told you already, there couldn't be a complete Latin square made by the shuffled cyclic method, but it might be possible that there could be a complete Latin square made by some other method. And at the moment, we don't know. Going on, 11, 13, etc. At the moment, nothing is known. And by that, I mean just that. We haven't found a complete Latin square, but neither do we know whether one does or doesn't exist. But if we go on from numbers a bit higher than that, suddenly we start to have a rather positive result. If we have an odd number, which is of the form p times q, where p and q are both odd primes and q divides p minus 1, then in fact there is a complete Latin square of that size n, and it's made by a variant of the shuffled cyclic method. Well, the bad thing about this theorem is it starts to apply for moderately large numbers. 21, where p is 7 and q is 3, 39, 55, 57, and so on. Now, your attitude to this theorem depends rather on whether you're a pure mathematician or an applied mathematician. If you find it exciting that you've got a result like this going on for forever, then probably you're a pure mathematician. If you look at it and say, well, this is no use. The first time I can apply this is 21 treatments. I never have those number of treatments. Then you're an applied mathematician. So let's remember, this all arose from a distinct practical situation in agricultural experiments. And I'm going to leave you with a challenge. It's a true situation that happened to me once. I had a telephone call in my office. On the other end of the line, there was a fairly important agricultural scientist from one of the experimental stations in Scotland. He told me he was trying to design an experiment on raspberries on treatments that would control mildew. He would thought of making a Latin square, but he was a bit worried about the fact that mildew might spread into neighbouring plots, and someone had told him that he should take my advice. Well, I was delighted. I said, yes, great, you've come to exactly the right person. You just tell me how many different treatments you have, and I will design you a Latin square. Well, he said, I've got five treatments. And we've just seen that there is no complete Latin square for five treatments. So, how would you design that experiment? And I'll leave you with that challenge.